Hey, good morning and welcome to our audience watching this virtual town hall online as we live stream on Divid's Facebook and Twitter. This morning we have the Honorable Ryan McCarthy, Secretary of the Army, General James McConville, Chief of Staff of the Army, and Sergeant Major of the Army, Tony Grinston. Gentlemen, good morning and thank you for taking time for questions uh, in this virtual town hall. Like the nation, the Army is confronting COVID-19 and has made adjustments so it can protect the force to ensure it can protect the nation. This town hall is a chance to hear from you, our Army senior leaders, uh, as you answer frequently asked questions from soldiers, families, and DA civilians on Army standards, policies, and programs as they relate to COVID-19. Uh, I'll turn it over to uh, all of you for opening comments, starting with Secretary McCarthy, and then we'll get into some questions for the next 30 minutes or so. Mr. Secretary, sir. Thanks, Kurt. Uh, good morning, everyone. And uh, obviously, we live in extraordinary times as I sit here flanked by my teammates who are sitting in an empty auditorium as we're trying to exhibit the behaviors of social distancing and ensuring we can protect the force as we manage ourselves through these extraordinary conditions. These are truly extraordinary times that we live in, and it takes measures and great people to get through that. Uh, the Army has been truly remarkable in its performance, really starting with the leadership of men like General A. Abrams and General Roger Cloutier, uh, who both in Korea and Italy, uh, respectively, who were on the front end of this challenge. And both of these men and their leadership teams acted quickly and decisively and have shared their lessons learned as we've combated this extraordinary event in our lives. And it's helped the Army gauge itself to move quickly and decisively, none more so than the installation commanders all over the earth, of how quickly they've moved at a decentralized nature and have really done everything they can to protect the formations and the families housed on those installations. With over 19,000 soldiers deployed across the 50 states and four territories and thousands more in the queue from our National Guard, they are on the front end providing logistical capability, medical first responders, as well as active duty units from the 101st, 4th ID, and 1st Cav that were among the first to go in New York and Washington. I know the Chief will talk about that here in a second. But the other things to look forward to, the Medical Research and Development Command, which is led by General Mike Talley, doing an amazing job, 24 hours a day, two 12-hour shifts, seven days a week, pursuing a vaccine. There are 24 candidates across five different uh, tracks that have four of which are in human testing. This is the most extraordinary collaborative event in vaccination research, maybe in the history of mankind, and they're moving at a quick pace. The Army's uh, vaccine candidate in particular is moving uh, into the primate testing this summer. So a uh, lot's to look forward to, but more so than anything, it's just the performance and resilience of our men and women helping their fellow countrymen and still meeting national objectives worldwide with 191,000 troops deployed. Chief. Well, well thank you, Secretary. And um, you know, in the Army, we talk about people first. And when we talk about people, we're talking about our soldiers, we're talking about our families, we're talking about our civilians, we're talking about our soldiers for life, our retirees and veterans, and every one of our people has been in the fight. And I just wanna say how, how proud I am of each and every one of you. This has disrupted everyone's life, and everyone is doing their share of the task. It may be washing their hands, it may be social distancing, it may be um, sheltering in place to, to minimize their exposure. It may be uh, the medical professionals that I saw in New York City that stood up the Javis Center and right now are treating COVID-19 um, uh, patients and helping out the New York City. It may be uh, the medical professionals that I saw out in Washington State that put up a field hospital in, in a couple of days and are there to support the state. And as the secretary said, our, our scientists uh, that, are, that are working around the clock uh, to, uh, to, to get a vaccination, to do high-speed testing, and uh, to get some treatment to, to help us uh, defeat the virus. Our, our reserve forces have stood up 15 urban augmentation task forces that are being deployed right now. Our National Guard is in every single state uh, doing incredible things. So this is a super team effort coming together to both protect the force and protect the nation at the same time while we have about 190,000 soldiers uh, deployed in 140 countries throughout the world. So I just want to say to all of you how impressed I am with you, how proud I am what you're doing, and I'd like to turn it over to Sergeant Major for some comments. Yeah, Mr. Secretary Chief, 
I just want to start with saying, uh, echoing what Steve just said about how we pr are so proud of everybody and what they've done to stay fit during this time. When you talk about fit, discipline, and a cohesive team, when actually things go bad, I think you can get through bad times if you have a fit, disciplined, and cohesive team. And to me, it's, it's very clear that we have a disciplined force that can follow those, those orders that are given to us because we can't mobilize a team that's sick. So you gotta protect the force, we protect the force, they're disciplined, they did the measures that they needed to do, they came together, and then we could actually send those forces out to those places like New York and Washington. So when the nation called on our soldiers, our soldiers were ready. And that's what it means to be uh, protect the force in order so we can protect the nation. I'm very proud of everybody and what they've done. And we got to stay disciplined. We got to stay healthy and stay fit. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, well, first question we'll take, uh, we hear a lot of, uh, online or see a lot online, it has to do with social distancing. As you mentioned in your opening comments, Mr. Secretary and Chief, social distancing is a big thing. You're six feet apart on stage. Big question that we're seeing online is how are units supposed to train while adhering to social distancing uh, and other CDC guidelines? We don't take that one. Yeah, I'll take, I'll take this and I'll give Sergeant Major get, get a chance. Is, uh, you know, the, the force still has to be ready to fight. Uh, we still have uh, adversaries out there that wish us harm. We still have soldiers in combat. Uh, but what it really comes down to is how do you train while protecting the force? And you can do physical fitness, uh, just keep six feet uh, apart. You can do small unit training. Uh, we like to talk about our squads with uh, five meters uh, between uh, soldiers in the wedge. And what we're asking commanders to do is, is recognize what the threat is where they're at. And this virus is a threat. And we have to change the way we do business. And we've got to min minimize exposure. And we also need to uh, make sure that we're taking care of our soldiers. So some, some large collective training is not going on. We canceled uh, major training exercises like Defender 20. We canceled combat training rotations to protect the force. And we expect every commander to do that. Sergeant Major? Yes, sir. Uh, it's, it's about having the bubble also, is making sure once we don't let the virus in to our little group. We, we do our social distancing, we keep our hands clean, and then we can still do our individual tasks. Those are normally done at the team and the squad level. You gotta keep some spacing. But the most important thing is don't let the virus into your organization, and then you can do the training that the, the leadership has asked you to do. On a related topic, on Sunday, the Department of Defense, uh, the Secretary uh, of Defense Esper issued a uh, policy on the wearing and guidance of uh, protective masks for DOD personnel. Can we get an explanation of the guidance? Uh, I'll start when I think we have, have the uh, Chief and SMA uh, joining as well. Uh, the, the rationale behind the policy is that ultimately, if you cannot uh, exhibit six foot distance like we have here on stage, that it is encouraged to wear a protective mask. Now, uh, recognizing that not everyone may have a mask in hand, uh, you can use a neck gaiter here in the interim. Uh, I think we'll be publishing some guidance on this for the interim, but in about seven to 10 days, we are, uh, we'll have several million masks on hand to distribute uh, to the force. Uh, but this was a protective measure out of an abundance of caution so that when soldiers are in environments where they cannot be able to exhibit the six foot minimum distance for social distancing to wear a protective mask. Chief, you want any of anything? Yeah, this is all about protecting the force. Again, we want to protect the force so we can protect the nation. And we're putting measures, it, it runs from washing your hands to s social distancing to, to wearing masks. And we do, uh, we're working right now to, to, to get the masks out to the troops, they have it, but there's, a lot of innovation uh, going on. I was up at the first special forces group in Washington state. They're making their own masks and, and, and mass producing them. And our acquisition professionals expect to have the masks out in, in the next week and we'll be able to do that. Son Major? There's, a, there's an immediate and then I think there's more like a near term. In the immediate we're gonna do, like the secretary said, we're gonna get uh, those masks, non-surgical masks. Uh, if it's a medical mask, we need all those masks to go to the medical professionals. Uh, the second thing is 
don't sue sponte and then start cutting up your uniform and then throw in, and then, cause I want to have a camouflage and throw that on your face. Uh, those are non wrinkle uniforms. You don't want that. We're going to get you the mask. You've got either a neck gaiter or a scarf or something else that you can use a black neck gaiter, brown, some kind of scarf. That's fine. There's not going to be, this is going to be it. We're going to get you in the near term. We'll get you something either black camouflage to put on, but until then use common sense. Don't want to see any skull and crossbones on your face. Uh, maybe a brown or something uh, that looks somewhat professional or a non-surgical mask. That's fine. I just do. I, I do want to reinforce what the sergeant major said about using uniforms. I, our uniforms are treated with chemicals uh, for for various reasons, and so we we do not want people using these uniforms and putting them close to their face. Thank you, gentlemen. One of the most uh, talked about. Um, changes on line has been the permanent change of station pause. Uh, and the latest guidance addresses the opportunities to defer assignments due to COVID hardships uh, under nearly all circumstances, except, except those uh, for those individuals attending professional military education of six months or longer. Uh, is there any additional guidance forthcoming? And what is just the general guidance on PCS? So the Department of Defense has halted the, the PCS moves until May 11th. We are currently in conversations with the Office of the Secretary of Defense about how would we execute a uh, PCS season as safely as possible. So a lot of the things we're working on right now are what are the risk mitigation measures we could put in place to ensure household goods and individuals could move uh, you know, all around the country and worldwide if necessary. Uh, with respect to the, the, the specifics behind the prioritization, that'll be worked out as well. Uh, but this also presents opportunities, Chief, you can talk about the stabilization or some of those things. Yeah, one of the things, you know, first of all, the reason we stopped the moves is quite frankly, uh, we want to take care of our soldiers and families and for their health and welfare. Now we know doing that, there are some families uh, that had moved uh, they're, they're furnishing, they might have moved their cars, they're sitting in hotel rooms, and, and that's why we, we have two things going on. One is an exception to policy. If they're experiencing uh, such a hardship or you know, this is really putting them in, in a, a bad way, then what we want them to do is go ahead and request an extension, uh, exception to policy so they can actually move uh, under, under this directive. On the other hand is we, 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 we do have the ability to compensate them uh, for the money they're putting out during this time frame. And over, over the next 60 days, the other thing we've asked is, and something I've been an advocate for is, I'd like to see us stabilize uh, families longer. Uh, leave them in a place longer, and there's ways we can do that, whether it's doing more online uh, type professional military education so they can stay and not leave the family. But if we can leave the family, and, and uh, families should go, go back to the Human Resource Command and say that they do want to stabilize, and if we can keep them there, uh, for another year or so, we, we'd like them to do that. Sergeant Major. Yes, sir. Um, that's still a, we definitely want to be able to stabilize our soldiers, make sure they also go back to their chain of command, uh, they can go to HRC, but also go back to your chain of command and say, I'm already on that assignment. And on a case by case, is we're going to look at that so we don't hurt the readiness of any organization. But we do want to stabilize them. You have to just go back, submit a 4187 through your current chain of command that goes to HRC and request to stabilize where you're at right now. Thank you, gentlemen. Another very popular topic online is the recent announcement that uh, the Army is putting the uh, ACFT on hold or suspending it for the time being. How long do we expect it to be suspended? And is the current APFT, APFT still going to be valid? Yeah, first of all, the, um, the Army uh, fitness test is, is the test that's in place. Uh, as many know, uh, the, the future test is going to be the Army combat fitness test. And we've um, issued equip equipment to many of the units. Not all the units have the equipment yet. Uh, and so what we will do uh, with the input of the sergeant majors and, and, and commanders is we will come to a decision in the future about how we implement the Army combat fitness test. Um, you know, people still have the opportunity to, to work out uh, right now, and we want their focus to be working on those events that are associated with the Army combat fitness test because that's the test that actually gets you ready for combat. But as far as when that's actually going to be implemented, it's going to depend uh, that, that the conditions are set, and by conditions set, that means that all the units have the equipment, 
all the units have had time to get their soldiers ready to take the test, and, and when those conditions are set, we'll make that decision. Sergeant Major? Yes, sir. So, so currently the APFT is still uh, the test that's going to keep you uh, in good standings with the Army, meaning that if you had failed the APFT, you still have a failed APFT. If you have a current APFT, that is, that's going to carry you until the conditions are set that we can either shift to uh, the ACFT in the near future, but that's not made yet. But the current, if you have a current and valid APFT, uh, that is still what's going to keep you in good standings with the Army. Thank you, gentlemen. The, the reserve component obviously is playing a uh, big fighter, the National Guard and the Army Reserves. Uh, Mr. Secretary, you mentioned 19,000 um, soldiers deployed, a great many of them being from the reserve component. Are they, has it been worked out that they are, are entitled and have the same benefits as their active duty counterparts? Yes, uh, there was initially, uh, when they were working out the paperwork with the Federal Emergency Management Agency, what they have to do is a, a state comes forward, New York, and they request, they, they declare a public health emergency or a natural disaster, and they request federal support. And they have a, it's a legal mechanism called Title 32 where they can put a National Guard unit under a federally funded status, and it provides maximum latitude for the governor in this case to exercise all of the capabilities necessary to respond. Uh, when they were working out the paperwork for the mission assignment, uh, initially it didn't have the appropriate number of days to, to get north of 31 days where they can have all of the benefits. Uh, the uh, Army staff was very helpful in working this out with the Office of Management and Budget, and now it is all north of the, the 31 days required, so all of those benefits uh, should be uh, provided to all of these uh, these guardsmen that are out on the front edge. Anything you want to add, Chief? I just want to just kind of highlight what a fabulous job mm -hmm. our Army National Guard and our Army Reserves are doing. And are they there in the communities uh, doing some incredible work, and they are really making a difference. Grooming standards is, is a topic uh, that for both male and female. Um, can you clarify what the current policy is for the Army grooming standards for, for female and male haircuts uh, now that the barbershops are closed? And is there any intention to uh, implement a relaxed grooming standard? I'm going to let the Sergeant Major talk about that. Talk about <laughs> little, no, a little about that because that's a good Sergeant to Major you discussion. Too, and, uh, but what, what, what the Sergeant Major will talk about is when people talk about relaxed grooming standards, you, you have to start from what the standard is, and then we can have the discussion. So Sergeant Major, yeah. the bear of the standards, yes, why don't sir. you go ahead and take that one? I, I, I think everybody just needs to know what the standard is. And I'll speak to my Sergeant Major and my NCOs. Know what the standards are and maybe not go overboard. I say, oh, I want to make it sure it's next, extra close and high and tight. Know what the standard is. The standard is neatly groomed. When your hair, for males, when the hair is combed, it doesn't fall on the eyebrows. It's not on the ears. I know you're wanting more, but it, it's very clear in what the regulation says. But sometimes we want to, and we always want to overachieve on the standard on this one. I think we just need to understand what the standards are. I think when you read what the standards are and don't read into it and, and just follow that guidance, I think we're going to be fine. And I think for the females, it's, uh, you know, short, medium, and long hair, different styles. There's a, there may be a little bit more flexibility. There's no need to change what those standards are. But I, like I said, I think if we just follow those guidance uh, of what the actual standard is, I think we're going to be just fine. Yeah, so as the Sergeant Major said, <laughs> what the intent is, is meet the standard that's in the regulation. And then if there's a problem with meeting the standard, the idea that your hair is over your ears or your hair is over your eyes, we can have that discussion mm -hmm. um, and yeah. probably issue a pair of scissors to the yeah. people that have that so issue. So you would be exceeds, you meet. I meet the standard. <laughs> Everybody meets the standard. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, the Department of Defense, uh, a week or so ago, or about 10 days ago, also issued a... Um, a hold on redeploying units, um, for the most part, with the exception of, of Afghanistan uh, in, in some cases. How long should units who are deploying or redeploying 
from either a, a, a combat deployment or a named operation deployment or a training exercise expect to be in a holding pattern? Uh, well, I think I, I'll go ahead and take that one. Is, is you know each each unit is going to be in a different situation. I would say that um, you know the intent is to get units back uh, from training exercises uh, as, as soon as the exercise is over or if there's a change in conditions uh, for them to come back. And when they do come back, we need to make sure that they go through the proper screening and, and quarantine exercises to make sure that we protect them and protect their families when they come back. As far as for uh, combat operations uh, right now is, you know, so, some troops are staying longer. And, and I, I just want to go out to uh, the families of those troops that they are doing incredibly important work. Uh, some have um, had to stay longer. Uh, than what maybe their nine months was going to be. And uh, what I can say is they are really making a difference. And as soon as their mission is complete, we will get them back and get them with you. But again, they are really making a difference. What they're doing is very, very important. And we are extremely proud of them and proud of the families who are supporting them while they are deployed. Uh, sir, you mentioned uh, quarantine. Uh, when, when they do come back, uh, is there a set period of time for the quarantine? Is it still uh, the two weeks, or has it been? It, it is. It is. It is 14 days. Um, that seems to be the, the safe figure with with no symptoms of 14 days. Um, what we're trying to do right now is get more testing out, and uh, I think what you're going to see over the next couple of months, we're going to be in a much more uh, robust position to do more testing, which is going to help us. Um, you know, manage the force better under these conditions. Another uh, question we have is related to um, the PME, particularly the, the enlisted side, whether it be SLC or, or MLC. Um, a lot of, we know that uh, USMA has gone to virtual schooling. Um, we know that uh, the War College has done that uh, a little bit. From the NCOES side, is there a plan to go virtual there or suspend any of that particular schooling? Yeah. Sorry, Absolutely. And uh, not the uh, United States Military Academy, but the United States Sergeant Majors Academy has gone to virtual. They're doing, even though they have PCS there, they're using blackboard.com uh, to keep up with their studies. And we've also found that we could actually still do BLC. We did a couple of virtual um, BLCs where we would do a VTC from Italy up to Germany at a 7th ATC. So BLC, the basic leader course, and the United States Army Sergeant Majors Academy are still going on virtually. We have actually sus suspended the select, train, and educate, promote policy for ALC and SLC, the advanced leaders course and the senior leaders course. So those uh, sergeants that are eligible and good standing with all the qualifications meet the cutoff score, they will be promoted to staff sergeant. And those staff sergeants that are eligible that need to be promoted, they will get promoted to sergeant first class. There's two ways that you can make up the, the PME, the professional military education. They can actually go back and take the class once we move the stop move, or your unit can go in and say, I've done all the critical tasks. I've been in a squad leader position and I can ask uh, to be promoted without the, the course. Uh, so there are two ways, an exception to policy to get promoted without the course for ALC and SLC, or uh, you can go back and actually do the school. Thank you. And following up on that, Sergeant Major, uh, the promotion boards in general, particularly the local ones, uh, are, are they still ongoing? Uh, how have they been affected by this situation in your conversation with the, the uh, NCOs? Yeah, absolutely. And we've, uh, so promotion boards are still going. We can do them virtually. I mean, we're, you know, I'll echo what the chief has said. We're, we have learned some things that we could do and all across, uh, where it's a virtual board, where it's a virtual re-enlistment, we've seen those two. So you can still submit the packets for the board. The battalion commander still has the time on the board, so the sergeant major could have you do a virtual board. Um, you can do board packets, and that's all within the authorities of the battalion commander at the appropriate level. So the boards are still happening. Soldiers are still re-enlisting. We're just finding great and new creative ways to do this. And I, and I agree with the chief. This is going to really show what we can do in the future if we have to. News yesterday indicated that, uh, or news from TRADOC yesterday, or was that they plan to um, 
make some adjustments to initial entry training, particularly on the shipment end and obviously as they organize the first couple of weeks of basic training. Uh, how exactly is basic training and the shipment recru recruits being affected by COVID? Now this gets back to um, all about how do we take care of uh, soldiers that are coming to the Army? You know, their parents are sending us their sons and daughters. And, and what we want to do is make sure that we're providing an extremely uh, safe environment. So what we've done is we're pausing for 14 days and that allow really for the situation in, in the country to settle down. It's also allowing us to get all the testing capability uh, into our initial entry uh, uh, military training sites. And so we're doing that right now as we speak. And so as the uh, soldiers come in to initial military training, uh, they will be segregated, they will be screened, we'll make sure that they go into this protective bubble, they'll, they'll be doing physical fitness, and then we'll, be at the, you know, we'll have the testing in place to make sure there's no issues uh, with any exposure to COVID-19, and then they will go through the normal training that they've done. And then even when they move from these bases, we're, we're again, putting them in a protective bubble, allowing them to move on to, to their, to their follow-on assignments and training, and by doing this, we think we're going to be able to take care of all these uh, young men and women that are coming into the military in the best way. Hey, sir, I'd like to just, yeah. you know, just remember the Army's still open. We're still doing active recruiting. The recruiting stations may be closed, but we're doing virtual recruiting. So if anybody wants that's out there that's ready to join the Army, we're still open for business. We're still bringing those in. We're just finding new and creative ways to do our virtual recruiting. And... We're pausing on the sessions coming in, but we're still doing the sessions training, basic training are still going, and the Army is still open for business. So we made an initial uh, decision to pause for two weeks. Do, do we think we're going to be able to turn it back on in two weeks, or we're going to have to reassess that? No, we do. We, we, we feel very comfortable with the uh, procedures that we have in place. And what we've also done, which we've not, never done in the past, is if a soldier is unable to ship, they've gone through the entire process and they're ready to ship and they come from an area that uh, we're not shipping from, uh, we will basically put them on the payroll and, and, and allow them to be compensated, uh, basically reporting to the recruiting station. They can you know, continue the uh, workout and get, uh, get fit and then we'll bring them to the Army when the conditions allow them to be shipped. And, and, and again, this is a, 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 a good time uh, to join the Army. You get to be part of something bigger than yourself. Uh, you get to be part of the, one of the most respected teams in the country, and you, you, you get a part to really make a, a difference. So as the Sergeant Major said, as the Army's open, uh, we're still hiring. We're, we're, we're asking soldiers that may be leaving, going to a very difficult situation, if, they're, if they'd like to stay and they meet the standards and they can stay. I don't know if you want to say anything on that, Sergeant Major. Yes, sir. Uh, if they want to extend, we got a 12-month uh, extension uh, that could say, it's a, I, I don't feel like it's a good time to get out of the Army. If you meet all the standards to stay in the Army, uh, just go back and see your retention NCO, see your chain of command, and they'll go ahead and do that extension paperwork. It's important to also emphasize that uh, General Muth and Sergeant Major Gavia had been performing so well, that command has been performing so well with recruiting that they have margin in their objective for the year. So that even with this down month, taking this tactical pause to, to set the, the conditions, uh, we believe that we're still in very good shape. You know, touch wood as I say that, but uh, they've, they've found a way to really manage every soldier from hotspots in the country to defer their timing and to bring them in as safely as possible. Really a remarkable job by USAREC. Well, sir, speaking of USAREC, uh, the new virtual recruiting uh, programs and tactics that are obviously in place because of this. Uh, one of the questions is how long are the recruiting stations going to be closed? Uh, and two, how, um, how are those tactics and those programs going uh, given the current recruiting environment? Well, they'll be reopened when the conditions are such to be safe enough to get back into the office. But I think it's important to the points that the chief and the SMA have made repeatedly. We're finding different ways and they're, they're also becoming very effective. It may change the business model over time of how we recruit people. Less of the brick and mortar, more of the virtual, and then ultimately when they go to sign a contract, they meet face to face. Uh, we've learned a lot from this, this next generation and they, uh, they're, um, they're, they spend a lot of their time in the virtual space. And that's how we, we find means to communicate with them. Chief, anything you want to add? Oh, I, think the, I think the Secretary, you said exactly right. Is, is 
you know, out of every crisis is opportunity and opportunity to learn. And so what we want to do is take a look at the way we've been doing business, which in some ways has been industrial age. And we want to move into the information age. And what we're finding is where those information technologies are, are most effective. And, and we're going to take advantage of that. We're going to learn from that and we're going to grow. Another hot topic on, on folks for families are obviously the, the child development centers, just like everything else, uh, are affected uh, on some of the installations. Uh, why are some CDCs closing on, on some posts and then they're open on others? What's the, the variance there? Well, I'll take that. I mean, what, we, what we've done is, again, we're looking at protecting the soldiers uh, in, in their families. And I, I looked at the number, I think we had, we have about 200 and maybe 40 or 50 that are still open. There are some closed. I know that's very difficult on, on the families that use them, but it's, it's really managing risk. Uh, we have uh, child development centers open uh, for mission essential personnel and, and first responders that, that, that actually need that. And then at the same time, uh, some are closed and, and it's really come down to protecting the, the people that are taking care of, of, of our kids and making sure the kids are safe too. And what we want to do is provide a safe environment. And so, Major, you have anything you want to add on that? Yes, sir. Uh, even though some of the CDC goes, I, I, I'd ask if you're, if you're struggling with, you know, how to, to get to work and how to um, take care of my children and communicate with your chain of command. And sometimes we, we do want to be mission focused and I applaud all those folks. I would just ask those that are having trouble where your, your CDC is closed, don't try to go at this alone. There's a lot of people that are out there to help you and go back and say, I've, I've got, I'm torn. My spouse in their civilian job made me mission critical. I heard this one yesterday. My spouse is mission critical, but then my army job says I'm mission critical too. Go to your chain of command and explain that to them, and don't try to take that hardship on your own. And I'm certain that we'll make the right choices. Yeah, I just want to reinforce what the Sergeant Major said. That, that's, uh, we, we have an obligation during tough times to take care of our families, and they are a priority, and it's about people first. And so we, sh we should be able to work our way through those, those type of challenges. One final question, gentlemen. I, I know there's been um, questions about um, the testing capability that the Army has. Could, could we get um, an elaboration on, on exactly the testing capabilities we have at our MTFs, either CONUS, OCONUS, and deployed? Yeah, it's, it's um, you know, what we've done is, is we're, we're in the process of really ramping that capability up. We have, we have nine labs uh, that we can test at, but there's new machines coming on board, uh, one called a BioFire that we're setting down range uh, into all our critical sites where you can test on the spot, we, we, we got these Gen X, uh, both four and 16 that are coming online. They're gonna you know, give us in, increased throughput. And then there's this large machine, it's, it's called a, a Panther Fusion machine that really is gonna give us the capability that we need. What you really want is a, a lot of throughput. You know, a throughput capability so you can do a lot of testing and that's how you safeguard the force. And all those machines are coming in. They're, they're probably not, they didn't come as quick as we like them. And another test we're looking at, which, which we think is really important, uh, the testing machines that I talk about, talked about, they, they tell you whether you have it or not. What I'm interested in as the chief and the secretary and sergeant major is, have you had it? You know, we may have had soldiers that already had it, that had no symptoms, and we won't know. So there's testing that's coming out, not here yet, but it will show whether you've actually had uh, the virus, and that will help us manage risk in the force. The only thing I would add to the chief's points is that the, uh, the U.S. government put in place a, uh, essentially a nationwide prioritization. So many of the machines that were in the U.S. government's inventory went to New York and went to New Jersey and some of these hardest hit areas in the country. But uh, to the points that the chief made, there's a tremendous amount of capability flowing into the Department of Army over the next three weeks, and we'll have this at all of our installations in a very robust uh, capacity across the, the force. Well, gentlemen, that's all the questions that we have. Uh, thank you for your time. I'll turn it over to uh, the three of you for any final comments. Can you give us some of the last words? Yes, yeah, Sergeant Major. Okay. So um, I'd just like to say, you know, life kind of just threw us a curveball. 
And that's just kind of the way life is. You, you, it's not always the fastball right down the middle. Uh, this is a little bit of curveball. You know, we've got the greatest army in the world and we're just gonna have to adjust. You're gonna adjust your goals, reestablish new goals, you, you know, reconnect with your family, find some things that motivate you through this time of need or crisis, you know? And I just, a good friend of mine told, my, uh, told me one time, he said, this uniform around the world means two things. Right now, uh, depending on where you're at, this, this uniform means hope. Uh, it means hope that when the United States Army, active guard or reserve show up, that my situation in the United States is going to get better. But it still means fear around the world, too. It means if you mess with the United States Army, that uh, this, this uniform will come and we have to be ready to strike fear in our adversaries. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen.